Welcome to Stunt Stories. I'm Corey Eubanks. In 2004, I did a movie called Starsky and Hutch, where I was hired by a great, great stuntman, incredible man named Gary Davis. Uh, I was hired by him to double Ben Stiller for all of the driving stunts that were going to be done in the film. And there was another guy, Greg Fitzpatrick, an incredibly talented stuntman that was doubling uh, Ben Stiller for all of the exterior out of the vehicle, uh, jumping from rooftops. Matter of fact, Greg won the Taurus World Stunt Award for this jump that he did uh, on, the, on the movie Starsky and Hutch. And it, it was a great film. It was a, it was a, a weird experience for me in many, many ways and, and an incredible cast. I mean, it, it you know, had Ben Stiller, as I mentioned, and Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn. Uh, gosh, who else was in that? That Karma Electra was in that movie and Jason Bateman, uh, just Snoop Dogg. I mean, it was really, it was a, a real treat to be able to work on that film. And I took away a lot of very good experiences. And I also took away some pretty bad experiences from that film. Um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the bad experiences I'll, I'll, I'll share with you right now, matter of fact, um, since it just popped into my head. When, when you are um, a stuntman... And a stunt woman, but I, I'm just going to speak for the stuntmen. A lot of the times, your hair does not look anything like the actor that you're performing the stunts for, and so you are, uh, you know, you are forced to wear a wig in order to look more like the actor. And they had made this wig. They they wrap your head with this tape to make a, a like a like a skull cap, and then they'll send that off to have all the hair attached to it, sewn into it. It's very meticulously done. And these wigs are very expensive. And so they had this, this wig that was custom made for, for my head. Uh, I've got a rather large head. I wear a seven and three quarter size hat and took a lot of tape to wrap my head to make this, this wig. But one of the, the horrible things about it was the, the hairdresser on, on this, particular film, she would want to put gaff quat in my hair to, to, you know, press it down. Gaff quat is like putting honey in your hair. It's really thick and it makes your hair compress, but then it dries very, very hard. And, and every day I'd have to have that gaff quat put in my hair, then have the wig put on. Um, and, and, and I did not look good in the wig. It just, it didn't, it wasn't 1972. It was just, wasn't the hairstyle that you wanted to be walking around and a little embarrassing. That, that's another thing as a stunt performer. A lot of times you're, you're dressed up like certain characters that you wish you didn't have to look like. <laughs> it's just, it was just horrible. And it, it, and I had to go to the hospital, uh, dressed like Ben Stiller's character, like Starsky. It was, um, it was, <laughs> it was, it, it, what had happened was there was a second unit that was being shot that day. The, the second unit where Greg Fitzpatrick jumped off the building, uh, did this incredible high fall uh, or high jump, I should say. And so Gary Davis was going off on a second unit to shoot that. And the first unit needed to have a stunt coordinator on set. So they put on the call sheet that Corey Eubanks was the stunt coordinator. But that goes against the rules of Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers doesn't want to have you be the stunt coordinator and be in front of camera to perform the stunts. But here we are um, with me now being, because it, it benefited them for me to, on paper to have me as a stunt coordinator on set on the first unit while Gary Davis was the stunt coordinator and second unit director on the second unit. And here I am doubling Ben Stiller. And in this particular scene, they wanted me to drive the Grand Torino down the street and pitch it sideways to, to go down an alleyway. And in the middle of the alleyway, they had a crane. And the crane arm was going to rise up and let me 
drive directly underneath the lens of the camera. Now, I want to back up and, and let you know what I did to this Grand Torino. Uh, and there were several of them. There were several of them that uh, I had certain modifications done to. And then there was other ones, like this one I was driving on first unit, that I had nothing to do with. Matter of fact, I had never driven that particular Grand Torino before. It was the first time I ever my ass had ever touched the seat. Never driven it before. But with the other ones, from all of the stunt driving I knew I was going to have to do and reverse 180s and uh, peel outs and burnouts and donuts and all kinds of fun, crazy stuff. I had always wanted to rig a car up this way. I wanted to have four line lock systems installed. So what that means is on my center console, I had four Taga switches. If I had them all down, that meant it was turning off the brake you know, the the brake fluid going to either of the calipers. So you would have no brakes. But what that would do, it was, and also, also underneath my dash, I had another Taga switch, which was for my brake lights. If I didn't want the camera to know I was applying pressure onto the, the all fours, onto the brake pedal, I could just reach down and flip off this switch. Nobody knows that my foot's on the brake. And then I could turn on just the front left caliper. So when I am, am pushing on the brake, the brake fluid's only going to the front left. Then I could stomp on the accelerator and my back tires would peel out and brake traction and start to smoke and, and want to push forward, but it, it can't because I got my front left brake on. So it starts to pivot around that tire. And this this was um, an idea of mine and I, I tested it out at, in the parking lot of Hollywood Park Racetrack. And was really uh, very excited that I could I could make these additional maneuvers with this heavy vehicle, as opposed to just having a third brake system put in where you you stomp on it with your left foot and it locks up the rear tires and you could pitch it around the corner. Because um, I also had that system as well, but these four line locks, independent line lock system, was a pretty cool thing to kind of experiment with a little bit. But now. When I jumped into the vehicle on first unit, going back to this part of the story when I had to go to the hospital and why I had to go, this particular Gran Torino, I had never driven, Uh, did not have my four line lock system, did not have the third pedal for the hydraulic, for the emergency brakes, had nothing. And I thought to myself, you know what? I've never driven this car, so maybe I should do a very slow kind of half speed rehearsal uh, for this take, you know, I was, I was talking to the first AD. He wanted me to come down and, you know, show us what you're going to do. And I said, well, I'm, I've never driven this car. I'm going to just do a half speed rehearsal. So coming down the street, rather than hit, you know, trying to pitch the car, you know, to come into the frame, you know, all sideways and exciting and burning rubber, I just drove the the corner and, and went down the alleyway. Now, if you've ever driven down the alleyways in downtown Los Angeles, they're not the smoothest surface on the face of the earth. I'll tell you that. It's very bumpy. A lot of them are bumpy and potholes and um, just old asphalt that's cracked and lumped up. And some of them are just not in good condition. And this particular one had this manhole cover that was kind of elevated. Now, I'm driving toward camera and I'm going to go underneath the lens and because that's what they asked me to do on this rehearsal so they could take a look at it and see, you know, does this lens work? Does the camera movement work in time? Are they raising the crane arm too soon? You know, they figure this out. And sometimes typically we'll do, you know, two or three rehearsals uh, when you're dealing with a crane or, you know, any other, a dolly or you know, a steady cam or any other uh, uh, element that that's carrying a camera that you have to work out the timing. And sometimes you know, you, you get it on the first rehearsal and they go right into, into shooting the take. But this was our first re- rehearsal. And as I was driving toward the, the, the camera crane, my front left tire went over this manhole cover. And I remember going, wow, that was uh, like hitting a, a big pothole, but it, you know, it was, it, it was not countersunk. And it, it kind of jartled me a little bit. And, and the second I went over that, 
my with my front left tire, I felt the steering wheel become uh, loose, like it got disengaged, like it was there was no resistance. And I'm traveling at maybe 25, 30 miles an hour toward camera. And I'm going, I can't really, this does not feel like uh, the steering wheel is attached to anything. So I started to make a little turn because I felt the car kind of veering to the right. And I tried to turn down on my left on the steering wheel. And sure enough, nothing. It was not moving the, the, the front tires. The front wheels were not being turning to the left. They were still wandering toward the right. And I realized somehow the steering column had disengaged, had come apart. I learned years later, years later on another set I was working on when Petey, the mechanic, who was the mechanic on that show on Starsky and Hutch, asked me if I ever really knew exactly what had happened and why the steering came apart. And he filled me in and I'll tell you. But what had happened at that moment was I had to make a decision that this vehicle traveling 25, 30 miles per hour toward camera, toward the crew, to go, you know, underneath the camera lens, you know, I still got some crew members on the right in the alleyway and crew members on the left, and I have to thread the needle and I've got no steering. So I immediately went to my brake pedal to slow down and stop the vehicle. Well, again, I've never driven this car before. This was the first day that I had driven it. This car, when you pull, uh, uh, pushed on the brake pedal, it pulled very aggressively to the right, as it did. And there was a chain link fence that was running alongside that part of the alleyway. And then at a 45 degree angle inside the chain link fence was a brick wall that I ended up going through the chain link fence and crashing head on into that brick wall. But I wasn't prepared for that because on this chain link fence, it it was covered. You couldn't see through it. You know, like on a tennis court, they weave that... um, plastic through the through the chain link fence so you can't see through it was that it, I couldn't see that there was a, a, a brick wall so I wasn't bracing myself I didn't have a five-point harness I had just my lap belt and I didn't know that I was going to be going 25 miles per hour head on into a brick wall so I wasn't bracing myself and when I hit that wall my head snapped forward and my lower lip hit the upper part of the steering wheel and shoved my lower teeth right through my lip. And it's like being punched in the mouth. If you've ever been punched in the mouth and, and your teeth get, you know, poked through your, your, your lip and it bleeds, it bleeds, um, a lot. And so that happened and, Everyone's kind of, you know, freaked out because, oh my gosh, I crashed the car and, and what, you know, went through a chain link fence and under the brick wall. And Todd Phillips was the director and he comes up to me with the first AD to see if I'm okay. And I look up at them and now this blood is just dripping down my, my, my chin and onto my wardrobe. And, and I, and they looked at me like, oh my God. And I took my finger onto the steering wheel and I said, the steering went out and I spun it to show them. And this, steering wheel spun and spun and spun and spun and spun because it was completely disconnected. And then, so they're like, okay, we got to, we got to get Corey to the hospital. We got to get that stitched up. So off I go to the emergency hospital, which it took hours and hours for them to finally get to me, to get me stitched up, to come back to the, to the set to later on that afternoon to uh, do that, that shot. And while I was gone, the rumor that was floating around was that the stuntman, yeah, what happened? I heard there was an accident on first unit. What, yeah, well, yeah, the stuntman couldn't handle the horsepower from the car, lost control, and went through a chain link fence and crashed into a wall. And I'm like, that's not what happened at all. But when, when someone gets an opportunity <laughs> to make a complete ass out of a stuntman, they don't hesitate. They'll, they won't hesitate for a second. They'll all automatically just, yeah, that's what happened. Or, or, yeah, he was screwing around and lost control of the car. No, that's not what happened. The steering went out, and Petey, the mechanic on the show, 
who I worked with on another film years and years. I think it was a Transformers movie. Yes, it was. We were on location. And I think we were in Detroit. And just out of the blue, he asked me, do you know what actually happened on Starsky and Hutch when that steering came? I said, no, I'd love to know because I know it came apart. And he explained to me how they had taken that engine out of that vehicle because they wanted to put all this chrome on it, you know, and the, and the, the steel braided hoses and really bling it all out, make it look like it's just, you know, I thought there was uh, a, a scene in the movie where they were going to lift up the hood and, and expose this beautiful motor that's just, just glistening. There's just, you know, chrome everywhere. No, there wasn't. That was just the person who owned that vehicle, wanted to have Warner Brothers pay to have all that stuff done to it. But when, so they had taken the engine out, but when they put it back in and forgive me on this explanation, because I'm not a mechanic and I wish I could had PD here to explain it. There is the, the rod that's the steering rod that goes down into another uh, tubing and it, and it goes inside of it. And then there's a pin that drops through it and a cotter pin to keep it from coming apart. And they had just dropped that uh, rod from the steering column into the, the, the tube. I'll call it a tube. And I know it's not a tube. And there's some mechanic right now just going, Corey, my God, uh, I, will, I will text you the proper terms of what the, the pieces are and what they're called because it's not a, t- a tube. But anyway, envision a tube with a steel rod going into it and then a pin going through it with a cotter pin on the outside or a nut and bolt. It was a nut and a bolt, not a cotter pin. It was a nut, a nut and a bolt. That's what he said. And they had not put that back in. So it was just the steel rod from the steering column going in, into this tube. And it was only in it like maybe an inch and a half. So when I went over that manhole cover and it flexed and suspension and, and there, there's a little bit of flexing in the, in the vehicle, apparently in, in this older, you know, whatever year the Grand Trino was, what is it, a 75, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. And it came apart. That's how it came apart. And PD was explaining to me why, you know, and he said, oh, and two of the engine mounts were never, the bolts from the engine mounts were never reinstalled. He said, so eventually that engine was going to, was going to cock sideways and something was going to go wrong anyway. But so that, that was my, my one, one bad experience on that movie, which kind of then led into another. When I had gone to the hospital uh, and they found out on the production report that I was also the stunt coordinator and well, and the stunt double they thought, well, quick, let's let's take Corey off of the exhibit G. Let's take him off of the the books, if you will, off off of the call sheet. Let's don't let anybody know that he was the stunt coordinator because he shouldn't have been on camera doubling the lead actor. So, but yet, there, you know, I I wasn't on to double uh, Ben Stiller on first unit. I was on second unit. So, long story made short, in the accounting department. I got taken off like I didn't exist that day. Like I I wasn't there doubling Ben Stiller. Like I wasn't there uh, st- helping stunt coordinate for first unit. And so they, they well, he's not on, on the books that day. So I never got a paycheck for that day. Never got paid for the day that I had the steering wheel shoved through my, my lip. So that irritated me. And about three or four weeks into the production of it, and I, I keep track of the days that I work. I have a, a week at a glance and I say, oh, I worked on this day and, you know, it's been so many days I should have received a check by now and I didn't. And I was trying to get a hold of accounting and they were giving me the runaround. And uh, what I mean by the runaround, they would not give me any answers. Well, we don't see your name on the exhibit G, you know, we don't see your name on the call sheet that you were even worked that day. And I'm like, well, I did work that day. And like, well, we don't, we don't see that you did. And I said, you know what? I don't need this. There's other shows I can go work on. And so I quit. I said, that's it. They're not going to pay me. I quit. And I was home about three days and I got a phone call and from this gentleman who was working with the production and he asked me, uh, had I received another job? And is that why I quit the show? Because I had a bigger, better deal. And I said, no. I said, actually, uh, I'm in my workshop right now, welding on a gate and doing a little bit of welding. And 
I said, I'm not on another show. I said, I'm, in, oh, so you're, you're available to come to work? I go, absolutely I am. Because what had happened was Ben Stiller, they replaced me with someone else. And I think it was Jimmy Roberts. And Ben Stiller was like, well, where's Corey? Why isn't Corey here? I want Corey do, doing my stunt driving for me. And they said, oh, well, he got a, a, a bigger, better deal. He's on another show. And he didn't believe that. So he had somebody else call me. And I said, no, I'm not on another show. I didn't get paid. And if I'm not going to work on a production and they're not, they're not going to pay me, I'll go work on a production that is going to pay me. I, 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 it just makes common sense. You know, if they're, you don't want to go and work for free. So this gentleman said, well, I just spoke with Todd Phillips, the director, and we're getting ready to do this, these, uh, this chase scene on a golf course. And he wants you here. And, and he said, he will write you a personal check if you'll, if you'll come to work. I said, well, this has never been offered to me before. Um, wow, they really want me there, huh? He says, yeah, yeah. And they're going to get it straightened out with the county. And, and they, they understand what you're upset about and that you didn't get paid that day. And you know, they apologize and it was, it was a mistake on their end. And, but Todd Phillips says, you, you show up and he'll have a check for you. And I thought, okay, I got to check this out. This is, this is intriguing. I got to see if this is all bullshit or what, what's going to happen here. So I left and drove out from where I live up in the San Inez Valley and drove all the way to Santa Clarita. We're out to Valencia, uh, to this golf course. And sure enough, as soon as I got there, Todd Phillips' assistant comes up and hands me this manila envelope and I open it up and there's a check in there from Todd Phillips paying me for the day that Warner Brothers owed me. And then about an hour and a half later, after I went and got in my wig put on and got into wardrobe and we're filming myself and Joey Bacara, we're doing this car chase. He was doubling Vince Vaughn and we're doing this car chase on the golf course. Another guy comes up from accounting and hands me uh, another envelope and I open it up and there's my paycheck for the day that they owed me. And I was thinking, maybe I should just cash both checks. <laughs> maybe, maybe I, no one knows I got both. And I thought, nope, I can't do that. That would be wrong. And so I went up to Todd Phillips and said, Hey, I just checked this out and your check's no good. They, I called the bank. This is not worth the paper. It's written on here. Have it back. And he laughed. He cracked up. He was a fun guy to work with until, until I learned very humiliating. I learned going to the premiere of the movie with my my wife and and some friends of mine and it, it we're sitting there this is exciting a hollywood premiere of starsky and hutch and in the outtakes of the movie in the outtakes he puts a shot of me screwing up he put a shot of me crashing the grand torino when i wasn't supposed to so i got to explain that that was i got to tell you something i have done oh my gosh th that was so humiliating to watch this movie, now you want to see your credits at the end, but you don't see your, your name your see, before you see your credit, your name in the credits. You got to watch footage of your your screw up that you did right in front of everybody. And people were cracking up and looking back at me, you know, ah, Corey, did you know that was good? And I'm like, no, I didn't know they were going to, that Todd was going to stick that in the, in the outtakes. That, you know, bless his heart. What a great guy. You know, <laughs> I mean, come on, stunt guys, we have egos. You know, you can, we're, we bruise very easily. And, the maneuver that I had to do that caused me to crash also had to do with my ego. And I, I mean, just being 100% honest, I, and, and it'll all make sense to you when I, when I tell you, and I, I'll explain. I was being asked by Gary Davis. In, in the movie, the scene is where Ben Stiller reveals to Owen Wilson his vehicle for the first time. And I jump it out of this parking garage and then put it in reverse and take off backwards and I'm, Gary wants me to throw a reverse 180. Okay, that's simple. That's fun. We could all do that. Throw a reverse 180. Either way, driver's side, passenger side. He wants me to throw a reverse 180, driver's side, and then throw a front 90 degrees, more than a 90 degree slide, up to a parked vehicle. And that is where Owen Wilson is going to be standing. And I did a, I did a test... Gary Davis had me do a test. This was so nerve wracking. I show up on set. I'm driving down the street and he goes, Corey, stop there. 
and I'm, I'm maybe 20, 30 yards from Gary Davis, Owen Wilson, and Todd Phillips, who are standing alongside this, this police car that's parked at the curb. It's, it's sticking out at, 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 an, at an angle. It's not with both wheels up against the curb. It's like, you know, kind of a three-quarter angle when you park in, in front of the police station. And he wanted me to come down the street and snap. It wouldn't be a 90. It wouldn't be a 180. It's right in between that, that I would slide this vehicle close enough to them that Gary could reach out and touch the passenger door of the Grand Torino. And I'm thinking okay, you want me that close. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, it's like, Hey, it's like, you know, sliding up to and hitting your mark. It's not a big deal, but I'm like, are you guys, uh, I'm ready to go. When you guys step onto the sidewalk, I'm ready to go. And Gary goes, Nope. I want to show Owen Wilson how safe it is that we could all three stand here while you do this. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, I, I hadn't checked the tire pressure in this Gran Torino that I'm driving. Um, I know what, you know, I normally run, but I hadn't checked it that day because I thought I was just bringing the car to set to figure out what we were going to shoot that day. Um, and I'm not very comfortable with this because if I overslide, I'm going to slam, I'm going to smash these three, the, the director of the feature film, my boss and one of the lead actors, I'm going to smash all three of them into a police car if I overslide. And I got to be honest with you, it was a little stupid of me to do it. Um, I have a lot of confidence in myself on stuff like that, but still mechanical things go wrong. Like, you know, the steering wheel situation when the steering rod came out of the tube. <laughs> so I was nervous and I thought, well, I'll just come up a little bit short. So I came in there and hit the e-brake, the third pedal, the hydraulic brake pedal that I had a separate calipers for the back, these Willwood calipers that were not tied into the, to the existing brake system of the vehicle. They're completely independent. And I just, you know, to scrub off a lot of speed and I just slowly fed out the rear end, my passenger side. And I came to a stop at the angle that Gary wanted, but I was maybe four and a half feet away from them. He wanted me closer that he goes, well, that Corey, we just need you to be closer. I said, okay, I, I, I will on the day. I could, I could be as close as you want. So that was the ending piece to what the scene required me to do. And this is where it gets really complicated. You might like sometimes when I explain things like this, it's best you got to kind of, you close your eyes and try to envision what I'm about to tell you, unless, you know, you're driving or something that would be bad right now. But what I had to do was take off in reverse and crank my steering wheel down on the right to whip the car into like a reverse 180 with the you know the driver's side whipping around which would be going uh clockwise. Well, when you do that, the chassis of the vehicle is also going to move over a, about the car width, close to the car width that you're whipping the vehicle. So, it's taking me further away from the curb that he wants me to slide up to the police car. Then the next maneuver I have to do once I complete that reverse 180 is I have to crank the steering wheel all the way down on the left to then engage the hydraulic brake pedal for the rear tires to lock up to snap my not a 90 was more than a 90 but not a 180 to slide up to the vehicle so my point is the two maneuvers that I was doing going clockwise moves the vehicle the opposite direction from the curb. It moves you further and further away from the curb. So I was ending my maneuver way out in the street. And Gary's like, no, we need you back here alongside the car. And I'm like, yeah, but Gary, see what I'm, when I'm, when I'm whipping the, the reverse 180, the chassis is moving over and then I'm cranking all the way down the left and, and whipping it around. And I'm, and that it's like, you crank a wheel down on the left. The vehicle wants to go to the left and, and I needed to go to the right. And I'm like, I'm having a hard time getting it to go. He goes, Corey, he goes, it's like a curveball. It's like a pitcher throwing a curveball. Just kind of hook it in here. And I thought, okay, well, I don't play baseball, so I can't really, that analogy is not really settling with me. I can't really, that was of no help at all, but I'll try to hook it in there. So I thought, yeah, maybe I'm just doing it wrong. Maybe I need to come in at a certain horseshoe, kind of an angle, kind of a, a hook. And so I tried the next take, 
I came in and did the same maneuver and it kind of was getting me closer because I was really throwing the vehicle, like aiming for the curb as I was coming in reverse. And I'm going fast in reverse. I'm, I'm as fast as that Gran Torino would get going. I was getting up to speed going backwards because, because the, you know, speed on a reverse 180 speed is your friend. And I had also inflated my front tires to 65 PSI. So there was less of, less of a pad on the surface. And I, I whipped that vehicle around, you know, crank it down on the right and it starts to spin around to the left. And then I, now you got to, when you got to kind of crank down on the right, you got to uh, turn the wheel even more down on the left to bring the nose around to the left so you could pitch, pitch the vehicle. And I got closer. It was closer to what they wanted, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite it. Now, where that vehicle, where that police car was parked that I had to slide up to, seven car lengths or parking spaces over, there was another police car parked at the same angle that I had to pass that police car before I would go to make my, my move, my, that maneuver. And because it was like really not in my way, I didn't really th- think, I kind of disregarded that, that second police car that was parked there. I didn't really give it much thought and kind of put it out of my mind. And because I, I would pass it before I would whip the wheel down on the right to re- hit the reverse 180. And I was getting closer and I thought, you know what? I just need more speed. Oh, and I remember the, I think it was a third or fourth, maybe it was the fourth take that I came in and they had uh, taken Owen Wilson out and put Jimmy Roberts in there. And I remember saying to Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, I'm going to come in hot, buddy. You might want to get ready to jump up onto the car if you think I'm going to overslide because I need to come in fast. And I remember I came in fast and I hit the, whipped the reverse 180 and went to crank the wheel down on the left to pitch it. And I'm like, this is way too fast. And I hit all fours and just skidded into a stop. And so I failed. It was a complete, you know, not what they wanted and wouldn't match anything. And I remember Todd Phillips and Gary Davis having a conversation over at the video monitors and they're like, you know what? We're gonna cut to Ben Stiller inside a close up of him. So you know we've 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 got the pieces. Once we get that, that'll stitch it together. We'll see Corey coming down and whipping the reverse one eighty, and then we'll cut the Ben in there cranking the wheel, and then we'll cut to the shot of him sliding up to Owen Wilson that we already we already shot. Well, we may, we can make it work. We don't need to do this again. And Gary Davis walks up to me, and he goes, he explains that to me. He goes, you know, we we got this, Corey. We're gonna we're gonna just cut to Ben Stiller inside cranking the wheel, and this is where my ego got me. I was I was so determined. I was so pumped up. I was so confident that I could pull this off. I just needed one more shot. And I looked at Gary Davis and I held up my finger. I said, Gary, give me one more shot. I can do this. And he looked at me. And he had a little grin on his face. He said, okay, Corey, we'll give you one more shot. And I thought to myself, I should have said, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, if you guys could fix it editorially, that's the best thing to do. And But my ego was was taking control. I wanted to show everybody I could do this because it was a very difficult maneuver. If you don't think it is, go get yourself a a 4,000-pound car and, and go and try this. Try throwing and an, an a reverse 180 into a Ford almost 180 and but but have the vehicle uh drift two car widths to the right because every maneuver is taking you to the left. It's physics. It just can't happen. So I don't know, somebody would probably prove me wrong and go out there and do it and I'll be like, damn it. <laughs> I thought it was impossible. So when 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 Gary said, yeah Corey, we'll give you one more shot I thought, okay, I'm going to come in with the same speed I did when I almost got Jimmy Roberts, but I'm just going to whip it sooner. I'll give myself more real estate, more room. And I came in very, very fast. And I remember seeing out of my peripheral vision that I was passing that first parked police car and the one I had been forgetting about. And I I thought I was, my, my whole vehicle had passed it. And I cranked the, the steering wheel down on my right to whip it around. And it just came and kissed the front of that police car and, and stopped me. It, it, it ripped off the front end of the Grand Torino, just demolished it and came to a stop. 
And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about that police car. And I remember just dropping my head into my hand and just saying the big F word, just, oh, fuck me. And my good friend, Maurice McGuire, was on a long lens. He was a camera operator, great, great cameraman and good friend. And he was on the front of the grill and he pans to the right and to the door and tilts up to catch me with that look on my face like I just screwed up. I just demolished my career. Uh, it was I was so humiliated and just dropped my face into my hands. And that's the outtake. That's what they put in at the <laughs> at the end of the Starsky and Hutch movie. So humiliating. Oh my gosh. And and then the last thing on that film that I did that I was well, I was excited about was Gary Davis he says, Hey, and at the end of the movie, we're gonna have you jump the Grand Torino. We're down in San Pedro off this hill. And uh it was one of those opportunities where he just said, Hey, send it. Go go whatever your heart desires. And uh if you've seen the movie, it was a it was a fun jump to to jump that Grand Torino. And after I jumped it that afternoon, it was uh, in the afternoon, I then jumped on a plane and flew to Bristol Motor Speedway, where the very next day I jumped the General Lee at a Dukes Fest, a Dukes convention, this get together that they were doing every year uh, and got to jump the Grand Torino and the General Lee all in the same week. And uh, the, that was, um, as I was saying, that film Starsky and Hutch was, was a real interesting production for me. Uh, oh, and then the last thing I want to tell you about that movie was I had written this song at a band and we'd go, you know, play various places just for fun. But I got to open for Willie Nelson, which was super cool uh, at the Ventura Majestic Theater and open for Merle Haggard. But my band is a joke. We said, hey, let's do a rap song about being a stuntman. And I wrote this this song. It's kind of silly, but it, it's it's fun. And and my drummer, Ron Wixo, who was in the band Foreigner, he edited a video together. Matter of fact, it's, a, it's on YouTube. It's Hollywood Stuntman music video, and you could see it and hear the lyrics. But I was called to set one day on the first unit, and I knew there was nothing for me to do, but they, Corey, come to set, come to set. And as I got closer to the set, I see Snoop Dogg and Ben Stiller and Todd Phillips and a few other people, and they're leaning back against the Grand Torino. And I get about 20, 30 feet from them, and all of a sudden, music starts pumping out of these speakers. They brought a PA system to the set, and they're playing my song that I sing, this rap song, Hollywood Stuntman. And I'm like, oh my God. And everyone's like, the crew was wondering like, why are we, why are we not working right now? Why are we listening to this rap song? And at the end of it, Snoop Dogg says to me, Hey, stunt man, I dig your song. I said, thanks. That means a lot to me. <laughs> so anyway, that was, um, that was an interesting moment. Hey, I hope you enjoyed these Starsky and Hutch stories that I shared with you. And I hope that you've been enjoying listening to my stunt stories and on the shows to come. I have some other guests that are going to come on and we're going to hear their stories as well. And you're going to, you're really going to have some, some laughs, some smiles, and, and probably be amazed by some of the stories that my friends are going to share with us. Can't wait to uh, share them with you on the next stunt stories. Have a great day.